Well, hello friends and welcome to another Ask Zach. I hope you are doing well. Today we're gonna to talk about one of the terrors of the Telecaster, um, Ray Flack. Uh, I love Ray's playing and I had the privilege of taking a guitar lesson with him in the early 90s and getting to jam with him once at, uh, at a, a guitar seminar at uh, Belmont University and boy was that eye-opening. So, but today, I'm going to talk about Ray, why you need to know about him, um, how his hard rock past kind of influenced his tele playing and really made him unique and really his just this assertiveness to his sound and his playing, his attack, uh, the really ear catching things that he uh, he's he's played through the years, uh, unique you know, kind of gear choices and string gauges. So yeah, we're going to cover history and gear. I'm going to do some licks. The little opening thing was a little bit of a tribute to him. Uh, just kind of a, uh, you know, British Isle kind of uh, open string low, low thing. And then also um, playing a little bit of a lick that he played on an old Star Licks video. All right, so uh, here are the pause for the cause. Uh, if you've been enjoying the show and you haven't subscribed yet, well, please go down in the corner and subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, then I uh, ask that you go to askzack.com and you can pick up a, a handy dandy hat like this or a t-shirt or I've got tip jar information, uh, you know, down in the description if you'd rather do it that way. Also, I want to give a big thanks to Ron Ellis who sent me this nice t-shirt and he's a, a good friend and of course he's helped out a lot. Uh, through the years, he did the uh, rewind on this 57 Esquire. He rewound this, and then this is one of his Ron Ellis new tall pickup. And I, you know, love his stuff. And thank you for the T-shirt. And you know, just like old Buki, you know, I love a good soft T-shirt. Uh, those Gildans are just awful. So yes, everyone in Nashville knows that uh, you know, get the good T-shirts. So thank you, Ron. All right, Ray Flack. Ray Flack was born in 1948 in, uh, in England, in uh, Bognor Regis, or somewhere near there, which was kind of a resort town. And, you know, like many, he was influenced by the British guitar bands, such as, you know, you know Hank Marvin in the Shadows and uh, people like that. And then his playing started taking a turn in the later 60s under the influence of kind of some early hard rock and uh, Richie Blackmore, playing with Deep Purple, but specifically like the first two records, you know, this is pre Smoke on the Water when uh, Richie was playing, he was playing a 330 or a 335 into a Vox AC30, different kind of playing than what he did later with the Marshall Major and the, and the Strat. He also started to come under the influence of uh, country players that he was hearing and started playing in some different kind of country influenced bands uh, like Meal Ticket and Tiger and Tiger had Big Jim Sullivan in it and Big Jim Sullivan was kind of like for a lack of better words kind of like the James Burton in the UK who was a session guy and also he was seen on the Tom Jones television show and so he was a guitar player kind of like James Burton that you you know back in the day you would see on a weekly basis um, you know on television played with them and uh, became more, you know, again, kept getting, you know, was hearing stuff like Reggie Young and Roy Nichols and all these different things. And more and more, he's wanting to move to Nashville. So in 1978, he did. And at first, of course, he was trying to find a place to stay and uh, doing any kind of playing that he could, playing for free on demos or, you know, what, what have you, and giving guitar lessons. And one of his students was playing lead guitar for a uh, a signed artist named Joe Sun. Well, he's given the lead guitar player lessons and the lead guitar player quits the band and so teacher becomes uh, the lead player in Joe Sun's band because Ray needed a gig. So uh, then you know as always these wonderful you know happenstance you know kind of happen, uh, Ray was playing with Joe Sun on a, uh, a festival date in England, and another act on the bill was Emmylou Harris and the Hot Band. And at that point, Ricky Skaggs was playing in, uh, in Emmylou's band and was yet, you know, kind of working on solo material. And he sees 
uh, Ray Flack playing with Joe's son, and Ray thinks, aha, you know, because Ricky was, you know, wanting to, you know, start his own band, do his own thing, and he was basically going to put together his own version of the hot band, yet with a little bit more of a bluegrass slant, and so he needed his Albert Lee, James Burton guy, and Ray was the guy. And again, at this time period, there weren't that many guys playing in that style. And, uh, and, and, and don't think that I'm saying that Ray plays like Albert Lee and James Burton. Obviously, you know, Albert was kind of a contemporary of Ray. Uh, I'm sure that James Burton, you know, influenced uh, Ray Flack. But Ray has very much his own style of playing. As soon as you listen to the Spotify playlist that, you know, I'll have a link to, and you hear him, you hear that, I mean, he has his own tone, his own way of approaching, you know, the guitar, uh, yeah, and, and a really aggressive attack that made him unlike anyone else in country music, anyone else that's ever really picked up a Telecaster. So, Ray ends up playing with Ricky Skaggs, and that really, really catapults, you know, Ray's, you know, career forward because he's heavily featured on Ricky's, you know, albums. You think of things like Heartbroke, and uh, and that's a, a perfect introduction to kind of his his style, uh, where he's doing these low string bends and and uh, and just not playing like Albert Lee or James Burton. It's just his his own thing. And you have his solos like a Low and Lonely and Highway 40 Blues and, uh, you know, Don't Get Above Your Raisin. And there's footage of Ray playing with uh, with Ricky Skaggs that you can find on YouTube. And it's ridiculous. Um, Ray, you know, brought this energy level to that band that was just amazing. And, uh, yeah, I, I want to talk. Yeah, I've, I've seen Ray play many times. And so I'll talk more about that later. So then uh, he and Ricky uh, kind of parted ways for one reason or another. And, uh, you know, if you kind of want to hear more about that, you can watch my Ricky Skaggs Telecaster video where I kind of get more into that. But anyway, they parted ways. And uh, Ricky, of course, had to pick up the Telecaster and start playing it. And Ray started playing on sessions. And he started playing with Kathy Matea and Gail Davies and, you know, a variety of artists. And... Uh, by the late 80s, he started working uh, you know, with Marty Stewart. And this was another really wonderful era of playing, you know, because Marty's band consisted of Marty, of course, playing guitar and singing lead, bass, drums, and Ray Flack on electric guitar. And so Ray had all this room to, to solo and do fills and play all sorts of great parts. And there's also footage of that on, on YouTube of, of that era of Marty Stewart's band. Then Ray, for a hot minute, you know, played with Terry Clark. Uh, and then he started playing with Jamie Hartford. Jamie Hartford is the uh, the son of uh, John Hartford, who's, of course, known for writing Gentle on My Mind and being a, a great banjo player. Jamie Hartford, a great artist and guitarist. And he put together a band and... Uh, and they used to play downtown Nashville a lot, a place called Wolfie's and a couple other places that aren't there anymore. And I would go down there and see Ray play. And the whole band was fantastic. But yet every time Ray Flack would play a guitar solo, it was like somebody setting off fireworks in a room. It was just ridiculous. Uh, every time you would think that Ray was going to play himself into a corner and he'd always come out smelling like roses, and he had such an, uh, such an attack on the guitar and such a presence. And, and I don't mean like jumping around and gyrating or anything like that, but just his guitar, his voice on the guitar, just very uh, you know, un unmistakable. So after uh, playing with Jamie, he, uh, he kind of you know, went into kind of some of a, a semi-retirement you know, phase that he's been in ever since then. Of course, now he's in his early 70s. And, uh, you know, I hadn't been as much, you know, heard from him. Every once in a while, he'll go to a guitar festival or something like that and play. But, uh, you know, he left us a, a great legacy of work and influenced tons and tons of, of people. So let's talk about his playing and his, and his gear now. So when, uh, 
when Ray, you know, Ray played a variety of guitars, but he, you know, he really got into Telecasters while he was still in England, but he was playing Maple Neck Tellies. And when he moved to the States, he ended up picking up a 1968 Telecaster with a rosewood board. And the finish had been removed from the body. And from looking at it, it looks like it was a, uh, it looks like it was alder because it, you know, kind of has that kind of cardboard appearance and very little grain. Uh, and then he, he modified the guitar quite a bit. And that, this is the guitar that he played, th that he's most known for, that in most of the clips you're going to see him playing. And it, again, it was kind of a natural finished guitar that ended up with a black pick guard. He changed out the tuning machines. It would have had the, you know, the F tuners, you know, from the late sixties. And he put Shaler, you know, machine heads. I think at some point it ended up with a, a D tuner, you know, one of those uh, hip shot D tuners. Uh, he put a, a black pit guard, single ply pit guard that was, uh, made, not, not made out of Bakelite or plastic. It had, had an interesting kind of matte appearance. The pickups were rewound, which is very common for that era of guitar because they were lacquer potted instead of wax potted. And so he had both his bridge pickup and neck pickup were rewound. He removed the cover from his neck pickup. Uh, the bridge was also replaced. It was either a Goto or Schecter six saddle, you know, heavy six saddle bridge, you know, kind of like the, but, you know, the heavily chromed, you know, kind of American standard type bridge. Uh, and then uh, I think he ended up with a, uh, a Sabine tuner that was installed inside the guitar. And on this lip up here, he had the, the, uh, you know, the little readout and, uh, and that was his guitar. Uh, string wise, he used a very interesting set that kind of went along with just his, you know, the way he played and how hard he played. In some ways, I would say, I would say Ray Flack was kind of like the country version of Stevie Ray Vaughan. And uh, just because he played so hard and had such an attack on the instrument. And so his strings were really interesting. So I'm not using these strings, but I'm just kind of pointing at my strings because to, you know, kind of go along with uh, what string it was. So it'd start with 10, 11, 15. So that, that's, you know, somewhat standard or maybe a little bit light. But then it went 32, 42, 52. Okay? And it was because he really hit the, the wound strings really hard. And even on the, on the higher strings, he played them really hard. And he really popped the strings. He had very aggressive attack. And so he had somewhat, you know, had big strings and also medium to high action. So when I took a lesson from him in the early nineties, I had the chance to play that guitar. And uh, yes, it was, it was not, uh, I wouldn't say it was hard to play, but I mean, it did not have low action and you could tell, and watching him play, he just, he really gripped the neck hard and he would, he had this, uh, or maybe still does, has this habit of using baby powder on the back of the neck. <laughs> and it would just, you know, for him, it, it kept, you know, things you know, playing smoother. Pick-wise, he used these little uh, teardrop picks, and I think I have one. Well, at least I thought I did. Uh, and first he used, like, Fender Medium, but the little teardrop, you know, like jazz picks. And then later on, he started using these things called speed picks that Dunlop still makes. And it was like medium gauge, has a little twist on the end. And so they were made by Steve Zook and then later on by Dunlop. And so he used, that was... So that was his guitar. Uh, the, that, funnily enough, that guitar was stolen at one point, and uh, he had another telly that he played for a little while while the other guitar was, uh, uh, while it was stolen, and then it was retrieved. And when it was retrieved, he actually, uh, he engraved his social security number on the back of it, that 68 telly. <laughs> and then later on, he ended up selling it. So he does not own the guitar. A uh, gentleman in Texas now owns that 68 Tele, and I'm not going to say his name or anything because I think he would prefer to not have that broadcast. So that's his guitar uh, and picks and, and strings. Amp-wise, he, uh, he, because of his playing style and because of how hard he hit, he you know, couldn't just use any amplifier. Uh, you know, in, in Nashville in the late seventies, you know, the standards would have been a silver face or black face fender, uh, some type of transistorized PV amp or a music man amp. That's what you would have seen around. Cause those were kind of the popular amps of the day. And especially when you talk about cleaner playing, 
Well, he always had trouble with the low end getting way too wooly, and uh, and then the high end would get too too bright, and so he started using a Lab Series L9, and those Lab Series amps are really really cool, and I owned two of them at one point, and most of the time I'd only gig with one, but I did do a few outdoor shows where I played through both of them at the same time. But it's a trans transistorized amp that uh, was designed by some of the guys at Moog, and. Uh, a guy named Pierce, who later on took some of those ideas and started Pierce amplification in the 80s. But uh, there's a transistorized amp that had a really cool uh, mid-range control. It's called a multi-filter. had a great compressor in there that just, I mean, one of the best sounding compressors you know, you've ever heard, and it's in the amp. had good sounding reverb. The amp really sounded big and fat, clean, and you could set it with some drive on it and it really sounded great. It really sounded natural. It sounded very, you know, tube-like. And that's why, you know, B.B. King, of course, used the L5, which is the 212 version. Same amp, but with 212s. And uh, he used that. The L9 had a single 15-inch Electro-Voice speaker. It's an EVM 15L. And let me tell you, it's the size of a Super Reverb and weighs a lot more. And uh, yeah, I used to carry that all the time. And uh, with... with I used to put a deluxe memory man on top of it because that was kind of the, the, the one effect that Ray used for a while. He used either an Echoplex or a deluxe memory man. I think he used a TC course for a little bit in the 80s, but then he just got to where he stopped using effects altogether. But anyway, I used a deluxe memory man and I would Velcro it to the top and, uh, and, and that, was my, that was my rig. I would just walk up onto the stage with my uh, L9 with the memory man on top of it, have my Telecaster strapped on and just plug in the AC cable and I was, I was ready to go. All right, back to Ray. Uh, so those, those lab series amps are really, they're really great. Uh, if you can find one to play through it, play through it. Uh, you know, they're, they're a great stage amp. They're not a great, you know, home amp at all. They, uh, they kind of need to be opened up, but, uh, and also they weigh so much that you, you kind of, it's hard to pop, buy one off reverb. You kind of have to find one locally, but, uh, they're, they're fun and they have a, a great sound to them. Later on, so that's the amp that that Ray used with Ricky Skaggs and on a lot of session work. But in the late 80s, early 90s, he picked up a 40s Gibson BR1, which this is was kind of the mid to late 40s top of the line Gibson amp. And it had a 12 inch field coil speaker, which of course has a transformer on it and had six L6s octal preamp tubes and had three knobs on it and uh, I know that amp because I got to uh, play with him through it so we uh, at this seminar at Belmont when I was a student there they had Ray Flack come and of course I was the guy you know that had to go up and play with Ray and so you know we both plugged into his amp and I didn't even have my own telly I had somebody's telly custom that had much heavier strings than I was using and uh, yes yeah, so you know, here was this little amp with venting on the back and three gigantic knobs. It had, you know, two volume controls and a tone control. But anyway, that was kind of his amp. And so most of the time when you would see Ray play at a club, he would use that little Gibson BR-1. And it had, like, 20 or 30 watts of power. And so he would use that a lot. And he would crank it up and, uh, and just get it where it was a little dirty. And it really, really sounded great. Uh... Yeah, and that was that was kind of you know his rig, you know that BR1. But he would still use a Lab Series amp when it was like a big outdoor thing or something like that. All right, we've talked enough about about his gear. Um, let's talk a little bit about his playing style. So again, he would do a lot of low string things. So if you think about, and if you haven't heard it, you, you need to check it out. It's you know Ricky Skaggs, you know Heartbroke. So it's an old Guy Clark tune that a lot of people recorded during that era because a lot of people liked the song. It was a great song. George Strait recorded it, Rodney Crowell, Ricky, but Ricky Skaggs kind of had the biggest hit on it. And uh, Ray played a very identifiable solo, and it's in, it's in the key of D, and it has some interesting, you know, not unusual, but it has some interesting changes. So here I'll, you know... So you have that kind of thing going on, and he played this on the low strings, and it was interesting because, again, playing melodic bends on the low string were not common, and here's what, what he did. You know, you have 
that kind of thing going on. So, I mean, it was unusual that he started the solo on the, on the low strings, that he's doing kind of melodic bends. Then he's doing these interesting, you know, kind of climb up things. And then, you know, there's the... You have these double stops and then you... And then you end with him, you know, ham, you know, popping the crap out of, uh, you know, the, the strings. So that, that was kind of his, you know, solo, which again is just very unusual. Didn't sound like Burton or Albert Lee or Ridge Young or anyone else. Just really very much his own thing. Um, you know, again, melodic bends. On, so here would be another thing. There was a lick that he played on a Starlix video where you get... And there, you know, he's he's bending this low E string. He's playing an F sharp and bending it up to G and then hitting those open strings. And it, and it sounds really cool. And then if you kind of, you know, and then you could do something like this. You know, you can do that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, another thing would be his use of thirds that climb up the neck. And he had kind of two different ways of kind of doing this. So... Um, one you have, uh, so I'll, I'll go to the key. Well, we'll stay in G. Uh, so you have this kind of thing. Okay, and that's, you're just going. But you're, you're kind of hammering on, pulling off and hitting an, an open G string. So here I'm gonna do it real slowly. Okay, so that's kind of the first variant. Then the second variant is is a little more difficult, and uh, it sounds even better um, because it's 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 really doing this kind of climb up thing. And this is it. And that's just. I love that. Uh, yeah, that's that's you know one of my favorite kind of Ray Flack isms. And then you just have his uh, you know just the way he attacks the strings, the the the, the low end stuff, uh, very exact uh, you know bends. Uh, just you know spot on you know bends. Uh, low string licks like a one way one way rider that kind of thing uh, uh, you know pull offs all sorts of great things so yeah love 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 ray flack uh, i was uh you know fortunate to have this uh you know, this, you know, little book from, uh, has the same thing on the front and back, uh, Ray Flax Solos. This was an old thing done by Center Stream and Hal Leonard, and uh, it has some of his solos that are transcribed. This is way out of print, and actually has Ray playing uh, a GNL broadcaster, and uh, a friend of mine actually owns this guitar that uh, Ray's playing in, in that, so GNL had given him a broadcaster at one point. But uh, this actually has an old guitar player article that was very helpful in uh, getting some good bio information. So, yeah, as always, there's a you know Spotify playlist for Ray, and then also, uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about Ray's playing and learn more of his stuff, Homespun did an amazing uh, Telecaster video with uh, with Ray teaching it in the in the mid '90s, and uh, I'll put a link to that in the in the description. Also, there's the old Starlix video that he did that's also good so 
All right, guys. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. Hope you've learned uh, some Ray Flack licks. And uh, yeah, have fun. See you next time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.